Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And it's, uh, it's, it's good to see you all here <clears throat> on this seasonably chilly day. Well, for the last few weeks, we've been talking about the Lotus Sutra, the Dharma Flower Sutra has various translations. And um, it's not an easy text. The chapter we're discussing today is called A Parable. It's entitled A Parable. And it's really a parable within a parable, I think. The scenes described in the Lotus Sutra signal us that this is a work of the imagination. Granted, it's certainly based on the Buddha's teachings. It's based on historical figures. But it would seem to be an allegory. What we, we might call today fan fiction, where the characters, the historical characters, have been reframed into a story in order to transmit wisdom in a way that perhaps couldn't be transmitted any other way than through a story. So in this chapter, we have Shariputra, very likely a historical figure, but being fictionalized into a discussion with the Buddha, undoubtedly a historical figure. So what would happen if Shariputra were asking the Buddha these questions? What would his response be? Well, part of his response in this chapter is to tell a story, a story of the burning house, perhaps the most well-known story in the Lotus Sutra. So, If one views Buddhism, the Buddha's teachings, as just a philosophy or a moral code, then they may well be communicated with words and lists, concepts, they well may be analyzed. But if there's more to it, maybe it is best communicated with stories. And the Lotus Sutra is full of stories. A story about the burning house may seem particularly relevant. The image of a burning house It's inescapable that we think of climate change, environmental destruction. When we think of the image of a burning house, our home, the earth.
and another aspect to the image of a burning house is the internal destruction and chaos that can result from greed, hatred, delusion, the three poisons the Buddha talked about. the inevitable consequences of uncontrolled greed, hatred, and delusion. So the internal burning house giving rise to the external burning house of warfare and conflict. Literal burning houses. So in this chapter, Shariputra in the prior chapter was reassured that he would become a Buddha. And he is pleased with this. The chapter starts with him talking about how, based on some of the things the Buddha had said initially in the Lotus Sutra, that those who relied solely on the early Buddhist teachings such as the Four Noble Truths, <laughs> we're only getting part of the story. And the nirvana, the state of peace they obtained, was only partial, not complete. And Shariputra is talking about how, when he heard that, it caused him great distress. But now, having been reassured by the Buddha and taking faith in that reassurance that he will indeed become a Buddha himself in a future life at some point. He is expressing joy and relief. But then the thought occurs to Shariputra, well, what about my buddies? What about all these other followers, the other disciples who have come along with me, what are they also going to receive the same treatment? Will they too become Buddhas? Setting aside what becoming a Buddha might mean, but clearly something of value that Shariputra was aspiring to at this point. But he was asking about, what about the others? He says, then Shariputra said to the Buddha, world honored one, I now have no more doubts or regrets. I personally have received assurance of supreme awakening from the Buddha. But these 12 hundred who are mentally free while they were in, while they were at the learning stage in the past, were always taught by the Buddha who said, my Dharma can free you from birth, old age, disease, and death, and enable you finally to attain nirvana. These people, some still in training and some no longer in training, being free from views of self about existence or non-existence, thought they had attained nirvana. But now, hearing something they have never heard before from the world honored one, they have fallen into doubt. Thus, world honored one, I beg you to give causal explanations to the four groups so that they may be free from doubt and regret. 
Shariputra is wanting the Buddha, uh, wanting the Buddha rather, to be just more clear. Um, give us something like you've given us in the past. Give us a list or, or, or give us a concept. Give us some words that will help us. Then the Buddha said to Shariputra, did I not tell you before that when the Buddhas, the world honored ones, by using causal explanations, parables, and other kinds of expression, teach the Dharma by skillful means, it is all for the purpose of supreme awakening. All these teachings are for the purpose of transforming people into bodhisattvas. But Shariputra, let me once again make this meaning still more clear. Through a parable, for intelligent people can understand through parables. So uh, then the Buddha enters into a description of a burning house. So this burning house was owned by a <clears throat> wealthy elder in the community. Um, and of course, at the beginning of the story, it's not burning. At the beginning of the story, it is large, holding many people, hundreds of people. But it's in disrepair for some reason. And not only is it in disrepair, it is the home of scary creatures. Just all kinds of vermin and dangerous and unhealthy things are in this house. Why the house is in this state, um, we, we don't really know, but that's part of the story. So the elder also has his children in the house and he's in the house when he detects that it's burning. There's smoke, there's fire, there's a blaze. He runs out of the house and realizes he has to get his children out of the house. So he screams to them. He screams, get out now, it's burning. You must leave. But the children are occupied with their games. They're playing with their toys and they can't be bothered. They're so absorbed that they don't even hear their father. So the father thinks about alternatives. Well, that, that didn't work. That wasn't skillful. Um, and he thinks about, well, should I run in and try to get them one at a time? But that uh, there's, it's unclear how many children there are in this story, it, get various versions of that. But in any case, when I say various versions, the, the, the Lotus Sutra has prose sections and um, poetry sections, uh, which kind of repeat one another. And um, they don't always say exactly the same thing. But in any case, there are children in there. And he doesn't feel like he can possibly, even though he could carry them out, he's strong and could get out of the house with them. He doesn't feel like he could have enough time to get all of them out of the house. So that's not going to work either. So he devises a plan. He tries to allure the children out by telling them that outside there are toys even better than the toys they have inside. There are carts. And he knows that some children like goat-drawn carts. They like goats. Some like deer and some like oxen. 
So he says, I have a goat cart and a ox cart and a deer cart out here. So come out and play with these. Come out and try out these carts, these carriages I've prepared for you. Well, that actually works. And the children drop their playthings that they're using inside and come running out and are saved from the blaze. We don't know about all the other creatures that were in the house, but the children are saved. And then <clears throat> when they're outside, it occurs to the elder that he has immense wealth and he should offer his children something grand. So instead of the carts that he talked about, he has much finer carts upholstered with fine silk and ornamented with gold and jewels and drawn, each cart drawn by a white ox, a white oxen that is swift, as swift as the wind. So just an unimaginably fine cart. And each child receives that and is overjoyed. So at the end of telling this story, the Buddha asks Shariputra, well, do you think I uh, deceived them? Was this deception? Was I telling falsehoods? When I allured them out of the house? And, and of course, Shariputra says, no, no, you weren't. You, you saved the children. That's enough right there, even if you didn't have any cards. But then you gave them these wonderful cards. So uh, then the Buddha goes on to explain the story a bit more. He says, Shariputra, if there are living beings who are wise by nature and who following the Buddha, the world honored one, hear the Dharma, receive it in faith and make a great effort wanting to escape quickly from the threefold world and seek their own nirvana, they will be called those who take the shravaka vehicle, shravaka, disciple, like the followers of the early Buddhist teachings, like Shariputra himself. They are like the children who came out of the burning house to get a goat carriage. And if there are living beings who following the Buddha, the world honored one, hear the Dharma and receive it in faith, and who seeking natural intelligence and taking solitary delight in tranquility and goodness, make a great effort to deepen understanding, to, to understand the causes and conditions of all things, they will be called those who take the Pratyata Buddha, Buddha vehicle, uh, the solitary, um, the solitary Buddha vehicle, the solitary practitioner. They are like the children who came out of the burning house to get a deer carriage. And if there are living beings who following the Buddha, the world honored one, hear the Dharma and receive it in faith, who apply themselves and make a great effort seeking comprehensive wisdom, Buddha wisdom, natural wisdom, the wisdom that needs no teacher and seeking as well a Tathagata's insight, powers and freedom from fear and who pity and comfort innumerable living beings, enrich human and heavenly beings and save them all, they will be called those who take the great vehicle 
Because bodhisattvas seek this vehicle, they are called great ones. They are like the children who came out of the burning house to get an ox carriage. All the living beings who escape the threefold world are given the enjoyment of Buddhas. Meditation, liberation, and so forth. All of one character and one type, praised by sages and capable of producing pure, wonderful, supreme happiness. So uh, the Buddha goes on to say that he is represented by the elder in this story, guiding those who have followed various paths toward the one path, the great vehicle. I tell you, Shariputra, I too am like this, most honored of all the sages. I am the father of this world. All living beings are my children. But deeply attached to worldly pleasures, they are without wisdom. The threefold world is not safe. Just as a, as a burning house, full of all kinds of suffering, and it is much to be feared. Always there is the suffering of birth, old age, disease, and death. They are like flames raging ceaselessly. The Tathagata is already free from the burning house of the threefold world. He lives in a tranquil peace, as in the safety of a forest or a field. Now the threefold world is all my domain and the living beings in it are all my children. But now this place is filled with all kinds of dreadful troubles from which I alone can save and protect them. Yes, I have taught and warned them. Yet, though I have taught and warned them, they have not believed or accepted what I said, for they have desires to which they are greedily attached. Therefore, I use skillful means, telling them of the three vehicles, enabling all living beings to understand the suffering of the threefold world. I reveal and preach a way of escaping from the world if all these children will just make up their minds to do it. Shariputra, it is for the sake of all beings that by means of this parable, I teach the one Buddha vehicle. If all of you can accept and believe these words, you will all be able to enter the Buddha way. This vehicle is wonderful, supremely pure. In all the worlds, there is nothing greater. Buddhas joyfully approve of it. All living beings should praise it, worship it, and make offerings to it. There are innumerable thousands of millions of powers, kinds of liberation, meditations and wisdoms, and other features of the Buddha. If my children have this vehicle, night and day for many eons, they will always be able to find enjoyment in it. And with bodhisattvas, as well as with all the shravakas, they will be able to ride in this treasured vehicle directly to a place of the way. Uh, so there are, there are a number, as you can imagine, of commentaries uh, regarding this chapter and this story. And um, there are scholarly papers uh, talking about, well, were there, are there three carriages or are there four carriages? Is, is the one vehicle different from the 
initial ox carriage that we heard about, or is it the same? Um, is is the um, is this different from the Bodhisattva path, or is it the same path? So, um, I don't know that the essence of the story requires that much analysis. I think it's um, it's clear that the Buddha is trying to tell us that all the various teachings of the Buddha point in one direction. And that they are skillful means, perhaps including this teaching. This parable itself is a skillful means to try to get people to understand that there are different pathways to wisdom depending on a person's particular disposition, temperament, experience. But that all of them lead in the, to the same place, a place of tranquility and peace. Now, there's you know, there's a, um, the Four Noble Truths is uh, in, like, for instance, in the Heart Sutra, it talks about uh, no suffering, no cause, no cessation, no path, which would seem to be a dismissal of the Heart Sutra. But I, I don't think the Mahayana tradition is wanting to at all dismiss any of that. They're just talking about its incompleteness. And the Lotus Sutra is to try to mend any rift that there may have been. In a way, the teachings of the Four Noble Truths are good for what they are, but they leave you in an odd place, I think. You have suffering, you have the cause of suffering, the release, the relief from the cause from suffering and the path to the relief of suffering. But what do you end up with is perhaps someone with no suffering. But what's that? What is someone with no suffering in this world? We've already heard that death is inevitable, illness is inevitable, old age is inevitable, sickness, all these things, not getting what you want, it's inevitable, all these things that are inevitable, causes of suffering. Are we just not to feel them at all? To be totally aloof? Are we supposed to end up just like a rock or a stone? I don't think so. And I think that represents the incompleteness here. And Maybe if somebody is suffering badly, that's just the teaching that is needed. You can have your suffering go away. It will be gone. Just follow the, these rules. Do these things. But once the suffering is somewhat relieved, and perhaps you can see more clearly, you notice that, yes, the suffering continues, but it's transformed in a way. It's not like it was before. It's not overwhelming. 
It's not so personalized. Your suffering becomes a more collective suffering. The suffering of all beings. Which it arouses a motivation, arouses a motivation to try to relieve it, not only for yourself, but for others as well. And this is exactly the Bodhisattva path. So, in this and other parts of the Lotus Sutra, I think the Buddha is emphasizing that our practice is not to reach a certain destination, a certain destination of unending bliss and no suffering. But it's an ongoing process of transformation. transforming our personal experience of suffering. And transforming it like an alchemist into gold, into compassion. So that the Dharma that we use as a refuge is not just a fixed thing, but a living, breathing dharma. And the Buddha is not only a historical figure who was wise and said wise things, but a living, breathing presence. as is the Sangha. So we take refuge in these teachings. I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. And um, perhaps I've meandered a bit. We will break up into groups. I don't know how you interpret this story how you personally interpret the story. What is the great vehicle that the Buddha keeps promising? And notice that we're still talking about the Lotus Sutra more or less in third person. He haven't, he still, still hasn't described this, even though Shariputra has been entreating him again and again, please tell me more concretely what we're talking about here. It still seems a little vague. So what do you make of it? The one vehicle, the great Dharma. Um, we'll break up into groups at this point. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>